Hello, uh, this is Kyler coming to you live <laughs> in intuitive moment, intuitive momentum fitness. Today we're talking about um, the mindset in our approach to fitness, and that is gradual momentum building toward goals while being extremely mindful of self-care. So the whole point of all of this is that usually as empaths, as uh, people who have experienced trauma, as people that are highly sensitive, who are hypervigilant, who are still in recovery mode, we are already being uh, taxed, overwhelmed, inundated, drained in all of the areas that we're uh, functioning in. And usually we don't realize that. We just feel like we're not keeping up, we're not doing enough. Uh, we are not um, having the impact that we want to have and not reaching the goals that we have for ourselves or for um, maybe goals that others have for us, whether it's employer or spouse or parent or um, someone else that we're close with. So... That's usually, that's usually the starting point of feeling like there's something wrong, I can't keep up, I need to figure out how to be better, more effective than I'm being. And so it seems like everyone else is being amazing, doing amazing things. Uh, being very impressive and we're having a hard time just with everyday life and normal stuff. Not realizing that we are taking in more data than the average person and kind of our senses are overloaded more than the average person. So So we're actually accomplishing more, it's just not visible. It's not something that other people would recognize. So then when it comes to our own health and our goals, the typical approach to health and fitness is just to be even more disciplined and even more regimented and, and uh, push even harder and and that can actually take us over the edge of developing autoimmune um, illnesses if we haven't already uh, got that and uh, just getting drained even more so this approach this intuitive momentum approach is all about prioritizing us, prioritizing ourselves and how we feel and making adjustments, making changes to feel better while still holding on to goals. A lot of the conversation around realistic fitness or realistic body image or um, realistic health aspirations is kind of about, um, uh, it feels like to me giving up on trying to be extremely healthy or extremely fit or extremely, um, having an, like an amazing physique or whatever and dismissing all of that as unrealistic. 
And I feel, I feel passionate about this in particular because that was one of the things I refused to give up on. I, I had terrible health. <laughs> um, I, if I was working out consistently, I got weaker and smaller. I seemed, you know, allergic to most everything and my weak immune system made me susceptible to anything that was going around. And so I was constantly sick, had, um, I, I never had the one winter cold. It was like three or four or five. <laughs> and, um, but I, I refused to believe that that was just how my life was going to be. I had to believe that there was something I could do about it. There was something, a, a better reality that I could experience. And so I just insisted that that was true and um, kept looking for whatever might be the missing puzzle pieces to help me figure out my health and improve my health. And so in yesterday's post, I, I shared the original 10 powerful habits of deep breathing, because if you get more oxygen, then your body is being supplied with more life Oxygen equals life, and so the the deeper you breathe, the more often you breathe deeply, the more cells in your body are getting life giving oxygen. Drinking water. I've uh, been learning a lot recently about the importance of electrolytes in retaining the water that you drink, uh, which is a huge factor in hydration. So, uh, drinking water and electrolytes. Uh, relaxation practices, more of uh, self-soothing practices. How do you soothe your nervous system? How do you calm an activated nervous system? Which, if you've experienced any trauma, your nervous system is going to be hyperactive just every day on an ongoing basis. So learning how to soothe yourself is massive. Restful sleep routines eating real food, getting nutrients in, mindful stretching, movement, lifting heavy things as the primary way of building up the organ of longevity, which is your muscle, um, self-compassion, and practicing gratitude. So these are powerful health habits that are fairly simple if in a gradual simple way and these are gonna these are the habits that are going to bring greater health and at the same time we have to be mindful of our needs and our self-care uh, at the moment so I was always very ambitious that was one of the reasons I ended up not tolerating the control that my dad had over me. It took me a long time, but um, I had all these dreams uh, throughout my childhood and um, wanted to finally be free to pursue them. And, and so at 22, I started that journey. But I was also like I, I didn't even I, I didn't even know I, it, it probably would have been too overwhelming for me to know everything that was going on because I, I didn't know at 22 that I had hypothyroid hypoadrenia Epstein Barr virus and I wouldn't know for another maybe 17 years that I was dealing with complex PTSD. 22 years of developing complex PTSD. So I had, I had a lot that I was juggling and yet I was only thinking, wait, I'm way behind. Like if I had been allowed, let alone encouraged, I would have had a, a bachelor's degree by now. 
Um, I was just getting started, just uh, choosing my freedom in order to live my life. And yet I was thinking I got to catch up to where I would have been um, if I had been free or encouraged this whole time. So, um, so I was, I was putting even more pressure on myself than I needed to. And I was also experiencing more pressure with my health issues and recovery issues than I even knew about. So there was a lot going on and all I knew was that I was struggling to keep up. And so there, you know, I was still dealing with the fatigue, um, that didn't change for quite a while. Um, so I didn't, I didn't experience a normal amount of energy until I was 27 and a half. So, uh, five, five and a half years after choosing to join the Marines, and uh, four and a half years after getting back from the Marines, being completely drained and sleeping 12 hours a night, 12 to 14 hours a night, uh, feeling like a zombie during the day, all that stuff. And just like making myself get up after a couple of months and um, go get some temporary jobs and, and figure out how to you know move forward and start moving towards some direction in life. Uh, which I believe that I was I was experiencing some kind of recovery at that point. Otherwise, I might not have been able to do that. So, um, but it still was monumental effort. So, the um, yeah the the weak immune system and all that persisted all, all through my twenties and. Um, and I still seem to get a lot of colds even in, into my 30s. Uh, a lot of fevers, a lot of viruses, a lot of unknown stuff. So, um, and then injuries. You know, you guys kind of see the highlight reel on Facebook. But, um, yeah, I... I and and, and part, of the, part of the problem, I think, is that when I, I have been relentlessly pursuing fitness for getting close to two decades. And, and so that is usually what people see is, is the fitness and um, the being active and the being strong and all of that. But throughout all these years, there have been injuries that I have been dealing with. So, um, as I got into a stable work environment in, in the fitness world at my first, uh, fitness job at the YMCA in Albany, Oregon, um, I, that's, that's where I started exploring sports from. So I think I was 26 start playing volleyball for the first time in my life, uh, starting getting some help from others as to how to play and, and how to um, hold my arms and hands and how to stand and position myself to play volleyball. And then um, signed up for an indoor soccer league. Soccer had always been my favorite sport and never got to play on a team. And so signed up for the house team at the indoor sports park in Corvallis and, and started playing soccer and I was like completely winded. I hadn't been able to do a lot of cardio because cardio drained me faster than anything else did. Uh, and so I've been focusing on strength training. And so thankfully soccer is just a series of sprints and um, I've always enjoyed sprinting. <laughs> I don't like running. Um, but um, but yeah, so then I started playing soccer, uh, getting more in shape for that as I did it. And then later on uh, in my mid thirties, started playing uh, pickleball. But, you know, kind of backing up a little bit uh, when I was playing soccer, uh, I did something. I was really excited about this new abdominal exercise and really overdid that. <laughs> 
And then combined with, um, at that time, I think I was playing soccer twice a week and, um, and gave myself an overuse injury in my hip flexor, especially on the right side. So every time for a couple of months, every time I went to sprint, I almost passed out and fell down because the pain in my hip flexors was so intense. So, um, so even though I could walk around, I looked healthy and strong. Um, it was really, it was something that was, I was feeling and very aware of the whole time. And then, uh, the next year I broke my collarbone playing soccer, recovered really quickly, really fast, but that was still extremely painful, really overwhelming. It took me five weeks to, um, do pull-ups again. Um, and then low back pain, I was still able to do uh, very heavy uh, back squats and deadlifts, but I would experience just this burning pain in my low back for the next couple of days after squats and deadlifts. And, uh, and then, uh, in 2020, um, I injured my left knee playing pickleball and, um, it's still not completely back to normal. Like, um, I used to be able to squat sitting on my heels and I can't quite do that yet. It's way better now. Uh, but for a while there, my knee would actually just swell up and I could hardly bend it all the way. Um, it would swell up every time I played pickleball or volleyball, uh, but it didn't feel any worse. It just swelled. So, um, so I just kept playing. <laughs> so I had that issue. And then uh, most recently my right elbow tennis, uh, tennis elbow. So just actually got back from a, uh, acupuncture session for that. And, um, it's feeling amazing. So I'm excited to play again and see how much better it feels. Um, but then, um, about a month ago, uh, I dropped the 90 pound dumbbell on my right side and it was, it was very interesting because, um, the week before I, I'd, I'd done a massive set with the 90 pound dumbbells and I've been doing chest press with 90 pound dumbbells, uh, working up to 90 pound dumbbells for many years. So it was just kind of a weird off day where I wasn't like paying attention to the fact that I didn't feel 100% that day. So I was like just going to push through and, and do it and I couldn't get balance on this side and dropped um, the 90 pound dumbbell uh, on my ribs. So still feel that a little bit. Uh, I've got pretty good range of motion, mostly full functionality. Uh, I've been pressing up to the 80 pound dumbbells, but, um, uh, but not the nineties yet just to let that recover. So all that to say, I have been focused on returning to health. And I think that, you know, it's easy to feel like when when you're struggling with a certain aspect of health or um, an injury or something, then a lot of times people think, okay, when will I be better? When will I be, you know, finished recovering and actually just be healthy? And I'm not sure that we are ever healthy. And I can't remember who is, there's a famous football player that, that said, in reality, we're never at a hundred percent. And I, I forget, I forget who said that, said that, but, um, but yeah, and I don't think that's the problem. Um, the body is amazing. It's made to heal. It's made to recover. And so this way of life is all about just doing the self care, uh, prioritizing ourselves and caring for ourselves in the way that we need as we need it continuously.
So having goals, maintaining uh, equilibrium, self-care, and monitoring the healing process all at the same time. Just kind of like, you know, it's the, the guy that spins the plates on the sticks and he kind of goes back and forth and keeps each plate up to speed. And that's, that's how it is. It's not a massive six week, eight week, 12 week transformation, and then you're different and you're better. And it's, you know, that's all done. It's an ongoing process, a never ending process of self care and self love. So at various times I've, I, I'm constantly, I'm constantly doing things like I've, one of the reasons I think that I do so well with massage therapy and a lot of massage therapists don't last past five years uh, because I don't think they're doing the self-care that they need to do. And I don't always get the massages that I need, but I am always working out. I am always uh, stretching and moving and foam rolling and uh, doing self-massage and um, staying active and keeping the blood moving and all of that. So, um, and then doing acupuncture and chiropractic appointments and um, all the things that I need to do as I need to do it uh, to take care of myself and to keep moving toward um, health. And my motivation is my old man self. <laughs> I basically missed out on what it is like to have a, a healthy, energetic childhood, strong childhood. And I'm not going to miss out on any more of life. And I, I feel like some people kind of have the attitude that... Um, they pushed themselves enough in childhood or they accomplished enough in childhood. And so they're okay with, you know, resigning to old age and allowing that to take them over. But I'm not. <laughs> and, um, and everything that I do in my fitness is all about the long term, the longevity of my life. How, how am I going to be the most functional, the most energetic, uh, the strongest old man that I can be for as long as possible for however long that I need to be here. So, so there's illnesses that we're juggling, there's injuries that we're juggling, and then, um, and then there's invisible overload, which is unique to us as uh, empaths, trauma survivors, highly sensitive people, introverts, um, we are doing more with the data that comes at us than other people are doing. And that is draining. That's overwhelming. That's exhausting. So we need to allow self-care for those things, for things that don't make sense to other people. So where is the margin you need margin in your life. And I'm saying that as I'm, uh, I know that I'm working too much <laughs> uh, with massage. So I'm like trying to move back to a little bit more balance um, as I've been catching up on bills and all that stuff. But, um, but yeah, moving into balance, uh, uh, creating margin in my life. Um, something that, took me forever to realize was that I get to have my preferences. This was something that was denied me in childhood. And I was thinking the other day about how uh, almost anything that I preferred was challenged and argued against. And it was seen as a virtue to do something you didn't want to do. 
and it was seen as lazy and indulgent and um, and weak to do something you enjoyed doing. So learning that I get to decide what I prefer is pretty monumental and something that I'm still struggling to allow myself the privilege it feels like to have what I prefer. And, and then understanding our choice as a creator. So this is, this is the, the part of, this is a, a concept within my story that I feel like it's possibly the easiest to misunderstand or the hardest to accurately relay. And that part is my choice as a creator. When, when I'm, when I say that I want to experience something that seems impossible, it's not, it's not, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the right um, term for it or the, in a, 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 uh, under, a, some, a, a, a term that will convey my meaning most accurately, but some people think of that as woo woo or I, I had somebody recently kind of get mad at me for posting that I believe that, that life is amazing. It was something like life is amazing and I choose that everything works out for me the way I want it to or something like that. And, um, and I was, I was, you know, when I posted that, I was in a, a moment where I was struggling to believe it. And I, I was trying to boost my own hope for good things to come. And someone got really mad at me for posting that because it was, it reeked of privilege because sometimes life just sucks and and there's nothing you can do about it, and it's miserable, and uh, you're powerless, and all of that. And I relate. <laughs> um, I know what that feels like, and I've, you know, I've definitely I felt that. But you know, um, I definitely felt powerless when every time I tried to work out all through my teens and early twenties, and I only got weaker and smaller instead of it helping anything, and. Um, and financial situation was terrible and um you know there were no encouraging parents and um you know all the things were working against me is yet i was still insisting on idiotically choosing to believe that something better could happen that something there was a better possibility for my life and my experience that it was possible to live a life and experience a reality that I'd never experienced before. I just refused to believe that that wasn't possible. And so over the years, I have seen and experienced the magic of remembering that I choose my life and not just resigning to the misery of what I see around me but actually choosing that I'm going to experience something better than this, even when there was no tangible evidence that that was possible. So this piece is one that I'm very passionate about, and yet I feel somewhat limited in being able to convey this because it takes a special person to be in a terrible situation and have the hope that something better could still happen, that some good things could still happen. Uh, that's why I love 
Lord of the Rings so much uh, because that story is just a, a beautiful illustration of pursuing the impossible. Like these hobbits are carrying the most dangerous possession of the most dangerous being on Middle Earth. And the hobbits are like the, you know, not skilled at warfare at all. And yet their only hope is that they will be so overlooked that they might get through and accomplish the mission. And there are just so many ways that that could have gone wrong. So many times where it should have been impossible. And yet one step at a time, one foot in front of the other, one breath at a time. And finally, it happens. And the best outcome happens despite all odds, despite every overwhelming impossibility along the way. So, um, so this, this is also tricky because there's not really a formula. And we love formulas. You just think if you just follow these steps, if you just do these things, if you just... Um, you know, follow my program by my, <laughs> uh, by my app or whatever, then everything will be fixed. But, um, it really is about you, you using your magic to trust and believe and to insist on the ability to experience something different and better than you've experienced. So Susie says it's like choosing hope over worrying, especially worrying about things beyond our control. Absolutely. I mean, I love worry as an example because worry is just using your imagination to imagine the worst possible scenario. When you could use your imagination to imagine the first, the, the, the best possible scenario. And, um, and I know that like, we are wired as human beings to seek safety and to try to shore up our defenses and to um, to minimize risks and all that. So it's a it's a survival mechanism and a safety mechanism to constantly be scanning for potential danger. And you know, on a certain level, that's smart. But then on another level, you miss out on so much of life if you're only looking for what could go wrong. Uh, because we have incredible power when we start looking for what could go right. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's the tricky part. But that is also, I believe, the most powerful part. So you do have to believe in a little bit of magic. You do have to believe in your own power you do have to believe that you get a massive say in creating your life. And it is primarily scientifically about resonance. So what is the vibration that you hold? Because that is what attracts life to you. You know, the people that are always miserable and they don't seem happy unless they're miserable. Um, and all the worst things happen to them all the time. <laughs> um, it's like when, when you're in a bad mood, um, a lot of times you, you get the worst version of everybody you interact with. Uh, whereas with, if you're in a, you know, a really upbeat mood, then you get amazing, the you know, most beautiful version of every person you interact with. And so who we are and the resonance we hold within ourselves is super powerful uh, in bringing more of the same to us. Uh, Susie posted again, it's almost like there's a little nugget of instinct for survival or resiliency or some fire deep inside a person that gives them the strength and courage to flee bad situations. Yeah, so it is, it is kind of a superpower to be that aware, to be um, in tune with what's happening and have uh, the defenses up. 
Um, but then also to be able to use that, the same skills, the same technology for, um, for good, uh, for finding and attracting the best case scenario and powerful solutions and all of that. So, yeah, so balancing your movement forward with your self-care and your recovery and all the needs that you have is so valuable. So I want to get to um, your comments. Susie says, I will say on this topic that I love to chase goals and strive for achievement for better or worse. On the worst side is continuing to push myself when I need to back off. In many ways, I've learned to do so, uh, such as mostly letting go of perfectionism. Currently, I'm dealing with what is probably another overuse injury, so I'm trying to scale back, rest more, and find a balance point of moderation. For me, it's about learning to be mindful about when to give myself a break, especially physically right now. Yes, I love that. I'm glad that you are paying attention to that. I do love that you push yourself though as well to kind of find your boundaries because sometimes you don't know. Like I, I, I got a new paddle uh, back in February for pickleball and I started experiencing some pain discomfort in my elbow and um, I just kept playing with it <laughs> thinking well, I'll just need to let my arm adjust to this new paddle and all that stuff but it, it never did. It just got worse and worse and worse to the point where I couldn't even play. Uh, there was a session where I was starting to play. I think I played one or two games, and I was like, I, it's, "I'm in so much pain, I can't even can't even play anymore." So, um, so it took a long time for my body to convince me to stop that. But still, you don't always know, and you just think, "Okay, maybe maybe it'll get the hang of it. Uh, maybe it'll figure it out." But um, and so that I feel like is a constant. Um, balancing act of learning how, how far do you, I push myself and uh, when, when do I listen? So um, yeah, tennis elbow sucks for sure. So um, yeah, but I, again, I just got an acupuncture session for it. I'm excited because uh, it's, it's actually been, you know, doing so much better since I got a uh, paddle designed to help with tennis elbow. Uh, last few months and so it's it's so much better and then just got the acupuncture session today uh, to see if that kind of helps it a little bit more and um, got a tournament this this weekend so excited about that so Susie goes on to say and then I appreciate the point that just holding on to a hope or dream is sometimes all we can do yes that's where I feel like I'm at with trying to back, get back to work in science. I'm making some efforts, could be doing more, but just don't have the oomph at the moment. I think the stress of the last couple of years, the collective stress we all went through, took the fire out of me a bit. But I'm still in the process of bouncing back. And I totally, totally, totally relate to that. I... Um, I can relate to what you said about, um, you know, holding on to the hope or dream for now and being content with that being enough. And then, um, you know, and, and for you getting working, getting back to work in uh, science and making some efforts toward that, but also, you know, you just don't have the energy to do it and so there there is kind of that reciprocal interaction with life where you put out some energy and then you see how life responds and at the right moment it happens together at the same time and life meets us and we meet life and um and so you know you could be doing more but it would be you know um effort that's not reciprocated at the moment so, um, 
so I totally get that because that's that's where I'm at with like the life coaching right now. I would love to be doing more of the life coaching, but um, I've instead spent a couple of months uh, focusing on massage, catching up on paying bills, um, and it's everything's been going well in that regard. But um, but yeah, I definitely still want to keep moving toward uh, more of the life coaching focus. So. Uh, so I understand you just, you know, being in the process of bouncing back with that. So the other thing is the point where you don't want to push past, uh, can change as you age and then it takes longer to recover from injuries. Yep. Uh, pro tip to all the kidlets of the world, don't get old. <laughs> That's why I have decided I'm not getting old. So <laughs> um, I've decided I'm 27 and I'm going to be 27 for the foreseeable future. So um, yeah, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's good to kind of be in tune with your body and, and all of that. Um, so yeah, thanks for the conversation. I hope you guys are doing well. If you have any more thoughts on this as you balance moving towards your goals with taking time to heal and um, not pushing yourself when you need to actually slow down and rest despite your goals and dreams being out there in front of you waiting for you to arrive. Um, yeah, post below or post in the group and we'll talk to you soon. Have a great week. Much love.